Well, here we are talking about um, the Russian Revolution again in the midst of our quarantine uh, that um, has us has us uh, confined to quarters for the uh, for the duration. Hope you are bearing up uh, well under these circumstances, and um, hope you will try to contribute, if you will, to the um, to the discussion that's going on in the um, in the um, in the um, a forum on um, on the quarantine itself and um, uh, our expectations for the future and all the rest of that. There are a couple of um, uh, good uh, contributions already. I'll try to make a comment on those, and I hope that uh, the rest of you uh, will consider making a comment about it, where we are all going. It uh, makes sense for us under these circumstances to uh, ask ourselves about those things. But today, let's talk about the... Um, uh, beginning of World War II, the first part of World War II, the Hitler-Stalin Pact, the period from 1939 to 1941. Uh, an outline uh, will be sent out with this uh, video, and uh, it will give an indication of the uh, of the topics that we're going to take up. Um, and um, first topic we have to take up, strictly speaking, first topic we have to take up is the uh, whole question of the Hitler-Stalin Pact. And, uh, and what sort of perspective we should take on the thing. So it's um, arrived at in August of 1939, and what follows immediately on that is the German declaration of war on Poland. And so uh, the Germans attack Poland. Soviets stand by while the Germans are attacking Poland, and Poland is completely subdued before the, um, the Soviets do anything about it. And then the Soviets uh, scurry once the Germans finish the attack, and Poland is completely defeated. The Soviets, Stalin, scurried to get the, their allotted portion of the uh, division of Poland into spheres of, spheres of influence, which gives us to, um, to think, at any rate, it gives me to think that um, Stalin uh, did not expect uh, Hitler's win in Poland to be so easy, and that uh, he thought that the Nazis would bog down, as uh, the, the armies did in World War I. Everybody is thinking in terms of World War I, remember, uh, the fighting that uh, took place in the trenches and uh, and the um, primacy of the defense and uh, the, um, you know, the great bloodletting that took place. And so Stalin is thinking that once Germany attacks Poland, it seems to me, uh, that uh, once Germany attacks Poland, he too is going to get bogged down and the Germans and the Poles are going to at least wear each other out, well, somewhat. Uh, I don't know that Stalin could possibly have imagined that the Poles would beat them back, but who knows if the warfare uh, were conducted uh, on the scale or in the manner of uh, of 1914-18, who knows? Maybe it would have been possible uh, for the um, uh, for the Poles to uh, to bog the Germans down. At any rate, that's certainly the gamble uh, that Stalin was taking in the in the Hitler-Stalin Pact: avoiding war and um, and in effect uh, standing aside from this German-Polish war. What it what it what it came down to. Um, and uh, the result of that was that uh, uh, the calculation proved false, Stalin's calculation. The Germans had conquered Poland very quickly, Stalin very unhappy about this. As Hrushchev tells us in his um, memoirs, um, um, Stalin very unhappy about the Germans having won so quickly in Poland. Uh, but at any rate, the Soviets standing by while this happens. And then uh, after it is all done, uh, scurrying to get their allotted portion of Poland. Talk a little bit more about what that means for the Poles, how Poland was in effect partitioned between the Nazis and the Soviets at this point. But let's um, take up the whole question of the um, perspective historians have taken on this and uh, the perspective that I, that I, I take on it. I, as I see it, and as is indicated in your outline, there are, uh, generally speaking, two uh, families of interpretation. There are quite a few interpretations, but I think they can group, be grouped into two families of interpretation. First, the, um, the one that the, um, is kind of indicated by Lowe's cartoon here with Hitler and Stalin meeting over the corpse of Poland, uh, presumably, uh, that um, this is a rendezvous of the totalitarians, that somehow they are brothers under the skin. According to the theory of totalitarianism, uh, the, um, the um, uh, Soviets have the basically the same kind of system as the Nazis, and uh, they're both uh, pretty much akin, and uh, there's a natural, kind of a natural 
alliance between the totalitarians. And basically, the whole world is much different from the totalitarians. And uh, and um, the Hitler-Stalin pact might be imagined as uh, really the, how to put it, a, um, a defining characteristic of uh, the Soviet regime and of the Russian Revolution, you might even say. That certainly is the case for a lot of communists in the West who are very disillusioned to read about the Moscow trials and about all of the horrible, ridiculous accusations made against the accused and their summary execution and this ghastly terror that's going on in the Soviet Union under this horrible Stalin regime of 1936 through through eight. This disillusionment is going to cause a big loss in the membership of the communist parties throughout Western Europe and the United States. And then, of course, the pact itself, that's going to be even, even worse. And you're going to see the uh, many people who had been crusading for several years now uh, for a united front against the Nazis now see that the Soviets have made, a com made common cause with them. That isn't quite an accurate way to put it, but, uh, you know, one can certainly charge that, uh, that they've made common cause. I would never say that myself, um, insisting on a little finer interpretation of it uh, than uh, perhaps was made by everybody at the time, um, that uh, they're not making common cause in any in any way, really, but um, uh, they are uh, coming to terms, uh, so to speak. And so um, we have to consider that. So that's one line of interpretation. This is a natural um, uh, arrangement of the totalitarians, and there they are. And what goes with that, all of this talk prior to this point from Hitler's coming into power, well, no, uh, we, we didn't uh, base it that way. We based it on the, from the Stravinsky riots in 1934 up to the Hitler-Stalin Pact in 1939, all this talk about a united front against the Nazis, a popular front against the, the Nazis, all this talk was a lot of nonsense and uh, was, a, um, in effect, a, a lot of fakery put forward by the Soviet Union. Their real intention all along, so the argument would run, their real intention all along was to make this pact with the, uh, with the Nazis. So that's the rather extreme first interpretation I have indicated on the outline, the uh, Soviets and the Nazis in totalitarian aggression. And what goes with that? The idea that uh, Stalin did this because he, had, he felt that uh, in a pact with the West, he wouldn't get as much territory allotted to him and that he could steal a lot of uh, territory uh, in the Hitler-Stalin pact, which is the case. They actually annexed the non-Polish regions, which the Poles had won from the Soviets, you recall, in 1920. They annexed those regions and attached them to the Soviet Union. You could say there was more booty, so the argument would run. There's more booty on the side of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Soviets uh, in a pact with Hitler than there would be in a pact with the, uh, with the West. And so that's why the Soviets betrayed the West, presumably. Not that the West was ever part of any big pact, as you know. Not that the West was ever part of any big pact against a Nazi Germany. Uh, but uh, that's why they betrayed the uh, British and presumably the British and the French. Now, this interpretation, um, it's a general interpretation. A lot of communists felt this way when they uh, quit the parties in uh, 1939. Uh, but it was uh, articulated most, I think, by the right, by um, uh, figures on the right in, in, um, in Britain and in France. And uh, a lot of them were really disillusioned with the Hitler-Stalin pact. Uh, Lowe himself did a cartoon of it, and it provides a little more nuance than what you see in the first cartoon. Uh, Lowe thinks these fellows are not exactly brothers under the skin. Uh, uh, Frères en ami, the French would say, this famous French for brothers enemies, the French, French would say, that uh, they're locked in this pact, but they're, uh, they're highly distrustful uh, of each other. So, of course, all those historical interpretations that go into the question of whether Stalin trusted Hitler have to be tossed out according to uh, Lowe's uh, way of looking at it. And I would certainly look at it the same way. There's zero trust, uh, uh, zero trust uh, between the two of them. And uh, they're both waiting uh, for, the, um, for the moment when they're maybe going to have to fight, or in Hitler's case, when they get a chance to fight, and etc. Then look at the background in this uh, cartoon. It's the oil fields. The thing they're going to have to fight over, Lowe is suggesting here, is uh, the oil that uh, one might find in the Soviet Union or perhaps in Romania. So this is really about the only two places 
that the Nazis could hope to get oil there using the oil of Romania at the moment. So we'll continue to talk about Romania in the relations between uh, Germany and uh, Russia in the course of this thing. Um, but uh, we'll also have to consider the possibility that uh, if Hitler goes on to attack the Soviet Union, he can penetrate into the Caucasus and get hold of all of that oil, which is even more than Romania, more than Romania has, and, and uh, really would satisfy all the problems of, of oil supply uh, that the, uh, the German Reich has, uh, the conqueror of those uh, Caucasian oil fields. So the matter of oil looms in the background as a uh, you know, very important issue between the two uh, dictators uh, in their curious, curious alliance. This according to the interpretation of, um, of um, the British cartoonist, British liberal cartoonist uh, um, Lowe. Uh, and then there are other interpretations, and here's how the French right looked at it from a right-wing periodical, uh, that uh, uh, Hitler has finally embraced, um, embraced Russia. But as you see from this cartoon, um, there's a little disappointment that is indicated uh, by the cartoonist uh, that the Nazis have uh, fallen into the embrace, so to speak, of, uh, of Soviet Russia. So what's indicated here is that Soviet Russia is really the big problem and that Hitler, if anything, whatever you may think of him, Hitler, if anything, is, uh, is a soldier against um, uh, Soviet communism, against Russia, against the bear. Uh, in effect. So when you see the bear looming up like that, that's the most harsh uh, kind of view that cartoonists can take, and you see many cartoonists doing this, uh, of, uh, of Russia in general. It isn't even really Soviet Russia so much as just Russia in general. As you can see, Hitler has betrayed the Occident, might even be the subtext in this cartoon. Hitler has betrayed the Occident. Now, some of my teachers, I've got to say, uh, some of them who were who were Germans um, uh, indicated a little bit of that in their discussion of the Hitler-Stalin pact. Um, uh, the idea that somehow Germany had betrayed. I, I think the first thing you might say is that Hitler or that Stalin betrayed. There's a that doesn't need interpreting. Uh, but this view that Hitler perhaps Hitler let the West down by not attacking the Soviets. Uh, this suggests an idea that somehow there is in the back of the mind of a lot of people in the West, I should say in Britain and France, and even in the United States, in the backs of their minds, um, some kind of notion that um, a battle, a war against Soviet Russia by Hitler's Germany is really not the worst thing in the world to contemplate, and more than that, perhaps is the only way out uh, for this period. So this is maybe even, I don't know, I don't want to put this too strongly, but maybe even an element of reliance on Hitler and a sense of being betrayed uh, by Hitler that comes forward. And um, that's even, you can even see that in Partridge's cartoon for the uh, British Punch, uh, giving an indication of at least one sort of British perspective. We've seen a lot of Part Partridge cartoons. They're very sharp. They give a very good idea of the nuances of elite opinion, a lot of, some of the nuances of elite opinion. Well, this isn't terrifically nuanced, I admit, uh, but it has uh, that same kind of theme. Uh, gee, uh, Hitler is caving in before Stalin. You know, what seems to be the subtext of this is that Stalin's the bigger problem than Hitler. Stalin is the bigger problem than Hitler, Partridge seems to be arguing. So there is some, some of that sort of stuff that you see. Lowe, however, takes the view uh, that I'm going to indicate by the second interpretation here, um, um, that... Um, the Hitler-Stalin pact is not so much a matter of the totalitarians getting together or some kind of, uh, you know, brotherhood under the skin of Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, as it is the politics of all of the great powers and a result of appeasement, which uh, climaxes in the Munich Pact of 1938. So here's Lowe um, showing the Munich participants. And so left to right, you have Hitler, Chamberlain for the British, Daladier, for the French and Mussolini for the Italians. Remember, Mussolini was a um, facilitator at Munich when they carved up Czechoslovakia for the benefit of the Germans. They did not invite Stalin, as Lowe is showing here. And Stalin is saying, there's no chair for me here. I mean, you want to decide uh, such an important European question uh, without 
the Soviet Union sitting down at the table. Of course, they didn't want the Soviet Union sitting down at the table. And the whole idea of the Munich Pact is to exclude the Soviets. And who knows, maybe even turn this thing against the Soviets, if possible. That's always a uh, implicit, implicit thought. I mean, anybody who really participates in this sort of thing uh, would have to be rather a ninny, uh, rather innocent kind of personality, uh, not to realize the implication of a four power pact uh, and its presumed hostility to those who are excluded from the four power pact. Let's look at all the four power pacts. Consider 1926, um, um, Locarno. There's a four power pact, same people, same countries at any rate, that you see seated around in this, in this uh, uh, cartoon. Excuse me, I'm getting uh, urgent phone calls and uh, and uh, have to uh, have to check them out. All right, um, uh, for the Four Power Pact of 1926, the Locarno Treaty. Um, the Poles immediately, uh, since they were excluded from that, they immediately went into a you know a species of panic o over the whole the whole thing. Um, they automatically get very nervous when there's a Four Power Pact. The Pato Mussolini. Uh, which was cooked up a uh, very ephemeral pact of 1933, same partners, same four partners, a four power pact. That implies revision in the East. Uh, that Locarno said that uh, uh, Germany wouldn't revise its Western borders, but it didn't say anything about the Eastern borders. So here's the same thing in 1933, the Mussolini pact, um, revision in the East. The Poles were so nervous about that that they decided they had to come to terms with Hitler. And as you know, they formed this pact with Hitler in 1934. So that's another example of a four power pact. So here's a four power pact again at Munich in 1938. They're gonna carve up Czechoslovakia, which is indicated on the map on the wall. Um, and they're gonna carve it up for the benefit of Hitler, essentially. Uh, but the Poles, the Poles are gonna be involved in it and get a piece of Czechoslovakia, the northern town of uh, Teschen or Cheshen, as the Poles would say. So uh, they get a little a town, a little province around it, a little region around it. Um, so they're, they're in on the kill, so to speak, the Poles uh, in this Munich pact. And uh, Stalin has to see it. No Russian personality, no Russian leader. It wouldn't have to be the miserable tyrant, tyrant Stalin. No Russian leader um, could look upon this pact as anything but threatening. Uh, uh, to Russia. Uh, it's a pact that excludes Russia. If the Poles were not involved in an alliance, or I should say in an agreement with the, uh, 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 with the Germans and going along with all of the German acquisitions up to this point, the acquisition of Austria in 1938 and now the acquisition of um, uh, the parts of Western uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, so anybody to the east has to worry. The Poles don't, but the Soviets, of course they have to worry. And that's what Lowe's saying here. That's really all he's saying. Um, and naturally, let's not think Lowe is soft on Stalin <laughs> or soft on the communists. He tries, uh, tries to indicate in the figure of Stalin that uh, you know, this is not the kind of person you can have sentimental thoughts about. Um, but what he is saying is that in terms of the great powers, how can they make a four power pact without including the Soviets unless uh, this thing is hostile, or at any rate implicitly hostile uh, to the Soviets. So that at any rate is indicated. And um, the second part of that argument, taking it a step further, further maybe, maybe than Lowe would say, but the, and here's a Soviet view of the matter, uh, that uh, Czechoslovakia in 1938 at Munich had been offered up to the Nazis, just offered up a piece of meat thrown to them. Uh, and they're holding the sign uh, Novostok to the east, to the east. We're tossing you Czechoslovakia in order to encourage you to move east. That at any rate is the Soviet take on, um, on the Pact of 1938. I don't think it's a bizarre uh, how to put it, paranoia or <laughs> a concoction of Stalin's uh, fevered imagination. I don't think so at all. It, it certainly makes sense. Any Russian 
um, personality would certainly have to think of it that way. Oh, and the Soviets toss in that it's to the benefit, of course, to the big capitalists in the West. He means the capitalist powers, Britain, France, or they mean the capitalist powers, Britain, France, the United States, and, and et cetera. Okay, um, and then here's the idea, very um, sharply put, um, uh, we're, we are stopping the possibility of a Hitler. We know Hitler's going to move somewhere, but uh, we don't want him to move to the West. And those uh, policemen there, there's a Frenchman and an English policeman, and it's Daladier and, um, and Chamberlain again. Um, and the sign says, uh, Zapadnaya Europa, uh, Western Europe. And uh, the, the other part of the sign says, SSSR, that is to say the Soviet Union. So uh, don't go to Western Europe, <laughs> attack the Soviet Union. And so there's a Soviet view of the matter. I don't think too far uh, from, the, uh, from the facts of the thing. Um, Okay, so these are the, inter the two interpretations. The uh, number one, the Soviets and the Nazis have this natural pact. They're rot they're totalitarians. They're dictators. Blah blah blah, and they're going to carve up Poland between them. Poor innocent little Poland is the is the assumption. Let's not go for that. But um, they're going to carve up Poland between between the two of them. Number one, and then the second one, um, the Soviets know that they're going to fight Nazi Germany. And this is the interpretation that you will find in many, many works on this topic, especially written by liberal-minded people or people on the left, or I don't know how to put it, uh, people of a reasonable countenance, or excuse me, reasonable um, um, judgment, uh, people uh, I like to consider myself among, maybe wrongly, but I do. Um, many of them will say, um, Gee, the Soviets had no choice. They fought hard for a block against the, uh, uh, the Nazis. The West let them down. Um, the Munich Pact, in effect, uh, made it impossible to fight against the Nazis. There was no choice uh, but to make this uh, pact with the, uh, with the Soviets. Uh, we know, however, uh, that we're eventually going to have to fight the Soviets. We Soviets. Uh, excuse me, eventually going to have to fight the Nazis. Uh, and that um, we Soviets are preparing for this day and are arming to the teeth. And we just needed a little while. Now, this is especially an argument that they could make after the war when you know that um, the pact only lasted two years and um, Hitler went ahead and attacked the Soviet Union in 1941. So they say, well, we foresaw this. We foresaw this. Um, Soviets and people sympathetic to the Soviet Union might, might argue. We foresaw this whole thing, and we just bought time. We bought time. And in that time, we created all sorts of splendid implements of war, and it helped us to beat the Nazis eventually. We knew it was coming, and, you know, etc. So that is the argument. That assumes Soviets are ready to fight. Ready to fight. So these are the two interpretations, two families of interpretation that you're going to encounter um, in any kind of stuff you read. Now, those of you who are doing a book review and who are uh, reviewing some kind of literature on this, um, uh, be alert for the possibility that uh, the interpretation of the person you read uh, may be falling into one of these two families. I guess there are other ways of interpreting the thing, but I think generally you see, these are the things you see recurring in many people's uh, work in the, uh, in the historical literature. I um, got to tell you that I don't buy either one of these arguments. I don't buy either one of these arguments. I don't think it's a rendezvous of the dictators of the totalitarians. I don't think the Soviets are buying time either. I think the Soviets are not right to say they were buying time. Uh, I think they wanted to stay out of the thing altogether. Now, when you say you want to stay out of the thing altogether and you know what you're dealing with in Hitler Germany, what is implicit in that? and nobody could avoid this implication, uh, is the possibility that Hitler's going to go somewhere else and fight somebody else. And this kind of thought appears in the West. It appears, I shouldn't say in the West, in Britain and France, and it appears in Russia too. And no doubt everybody uh, everywhere else. Uh, Hitler's in an expansionist mood. We, we can see that. And um, he's expanded to the South to grab Austria. He's gone a little bit to the East. He's got this kind of antagonism with France. He knows he's going to have to deal with France. 
They moved to the West when they grabbed the Rhineland in 1936. So who knows where he's going to go. And um, if we make peace with him when he's in this warlike mood, uh, the others are likely to make war with him. It's certainly backed up by the fact that right after the Munich Pact in March of 1939, the United States put so much pressure on the British that when the Nazis absorbed Prague and the rest of Czechia, that is to say Bohemia, when they set up a puppet state in Slovakia, that, that completing the destruction of Czechoslovakia, which had only been implied by the Munich Pact, well, not implied, but um, par uh, undertaken par partially by the Munich Pact, the American pressure on the British was such that the British finally decided they had to have guarantees, had to give a guarantee to Poland. Um, Hitler's next presumed victim here. If the Nazis did turn against Poland, uh, the British declared that they would defend Poland, so to speak. Now, this guarantee is totally forced by the Roosevelt administration. Roosevelt threatened Chamberlain. He said uh, that, uh, look, don't regard us. I'm trying to educate the American people against fascism. And when you make deals with them repeatedly, um, it, uh, it's going to ruin my effort at education. So don't depend on me if you're going to continue to make deals with the Nazi. But refuse to stand up for civilization. Look, that's the way he put it. Uh, if you refuse to stand up for civilization and continue to appease the Nazis, don't count on the United States. If you get into hot water, it doesn't work, and you end up in a war with them. That's quite a threat. Don't count on the United States. But Roosevelt really put it to the Chamberlain government, and I guess it's no accident that the Chamberlain Chamberlain government, you know, yielded to that pressure and gave guarantees to Poland. But think what the United States is urging upon others now. Yeah, there's no possibility the United States is going to join Britain and France in trying to help Poland out. No possibility. So the United States is saying, in effect, that if you value us as a backstop, that's what they were in World War I, wasn't it? If you value us as a backstop, you better get tough with Hitler. Now, if Roosevelt hadn't done that, I'm sure uh, Chamberlain could have gone on and on with this because he, because he was confident uh, that the Germans were going to move east, um, of course. And, um, and uh, assuming, of course, that the Soviets uh, they could not possibly come to terms. These two people hated each other like sin. The Germans and the Russians hated each other like sin. They could not possibly come to terms. Um, so there would be no danger of any kind of accommodation between them. Not a very brilliant, in my opinion, um, assessment of the foreign policy capabilities of Germany and Russia, uh, that they couldn't possibly come to, com uh, come to terms. So they were enormously shocked with the British and the French uh, to learn that the Soviets and the Germans had come to terms. Uh, so what's my interpretation? My interpretation is that Hill is trying to avoid war. He's not buying time, knowing a war is coming. He's trying to get out of it altogether. He'd like to see, I mean, doesn't this make sense? Doesn't it make sense for any German politician, uh, communist or whatever, uh, to try to stay out of a war? And more than that, any war that Russia, France, and England were involved in against Germany, that's going to be a war between Russia and Germany. Uh, that French are not going to come out from behind the Maginot Line. The British are not going to land troops on the continent if they can possibly avoid it. All I'm going to say about World War II is going to underline that point, um, you know, uh, emphatically. So it's going to become a war between Germany and Russia. Can the Soviets put up with that? Molotov, you can imagine Molotov saying this to Stalin. Can the Soviets put up with that? Can they fight, Germ fight Germany while... Britain and France, watch them. Um, so that's what the Russians are up against. War avoidance, I call it. War avoidance. So two interpretations. The two totalitarians have to make a pact, number one. Second one, oh, the Soviets know they're going to fight the Nazis. They're just buying time. They're getting ready. They need a couple of years. They know they're going to. 
and the third one, war avoidance, trying to stay out of the thing altogether. Now, the war avoidance has a few, uh, how to put it, it has some facts and some some evidence uh, to support it that the others don't, the others don't have. Um, and the facts uh, you have to say this war avoidance was not at all uh, strictly a, a Russian or Soviet position. It's a position that everybody has taken up to this time. Isn't that true? I mean, you could say maybe Mussolini made a peep against the Soviets. I mean, against the Nazis in 1934, but the rest of the story is pretty much everybody caving in before them. So Poland comes to terms with, uh, with uh, Nazi Germany in 1934. Poland green lights all of the German moves, uh, uh, you know, moves against Austria, moves against Czechoslovakia. And they would have green lighted, no doubt, a move uh, through Poland, even through Poland against the Soviet Union. Although I don't think this would have been part of Stalin's, I mean, uh, Hitler's strategic conception. Um, but they're the first one to make a pact, 1934. The British make this Anglo-German naval pact. That's a kind of green light uh, for the Nazis to move east. 35% of the German Navy, only good for the Baltic, really. Not good for the rest of the world. So, so there they are. And moreover, it's a big encouragement when the, German, uh, the British come to terms with uh, Nazi Germany. They start talking about how never fight them again. They repeat this even in 1939. Never, never. After Munich, they say, never, never fight them again, um, as they did in World War One. You can understand that from the British uh, point of view. That is to say the point of view of the British Empire, what they have to keep track of all over the world and defend all over the world. Um, so they come to terms in 1935. Italy comes to terms. Remember, Italy was against the Nazis. Uh, but then when it sees the British cave in before them, see, what's the point? You don't want to be alone fighting the Nazis, do you? Uh, better to make common cause with them. Well, much easier because Hitler's really a disciple of Mussolini. So you see that in 1936, then the Japanese start to try to read the tea leaves of Western of the Western powers. That's no easy task for them. Um, but they came to terms in 1936 and really had a quite aggressive pact against the Soviet Union, really. Um, in 1936, and, uh, and the very last one was the Soviet Union. So the war avoidance argument is not strictly a Soviet argument. It's a general argument. It was a general sense of war avoidance. I, we can't even exclude the United States, although the United States um, has the honor, we Americans can brag <laughs> when we have these silly discussions that people often have in pubs in England when they start talking about these things in these big general terms, we never made a pact with Italy. The French can say that too. The United States, we never made a pact with Italy. But the other big powers, yeah, well, yes, they, they, they caved in. Not at all uh, to be looked at in terms of normal systems of reckoning, cowardice, things of that sort. Uh, but just to be looked at in terms of war avoidance, perhaps you can see why a great power would not be eager um, to lead the struggle against Nazi Germany. Uh, even the English have to feel this way, although they have no intention of landing any troops on the continent, but they have to fear German air power, that the Germans can bomb the British cities, which they did in World War II. Would anybody, how to put it, would anybody take that on, gleefully march right into that kind of a conflict? especially in view of what happened to the previous generation of World War I. Would anybody take that matter, take that thing on lightly? No, no. War avoidance. I enter my plea for a third interpretation of the Hitler-Stalin Pact. War avoidance, part of a general war avoidance. Well, that takes us to a broader question. And now the question is, can you have a balance of power in Europe, can you have a balance of power war in Europe without Russia? That's a really 
good question for a historian of international relations, uh, which we are. Um, can there be a balance of power there? I don't think, I think the answer is no to that. Uh, now, often you see the argument, oh, if only Britain and France had cooperated over the Rhineland, blah, 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 they could have been, I don't know. Britain and France were stronger at that point. They all, it's often, a, sure, it's stronger, but I mean, does this mean they're eager to have a fight? No, 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 no. Britain and France against Germany, uh-uh. Uh, and uh, the British politicians, the French politicians, they're not children. They can add up the pluses and the minuses of this thing. No, no. They like to have a big coalition, like to put diplomatic uh, pressure on Germany, as Louis Bartou wanted to do in 34-5. But, you know, actually standing up to Germany, balance of power, no. no. So Germany can't be balanced by Britain and France. No way to, I, even Germany, France, and Italy. And Italy's not on board anyhow. But even so, cannot be balanced. It can be balanced with the Soviet Union. And if the Soviet Union does most of the fighting. So the next couple of years are going to demonstrate that about as sharply as you can possibly, possibly demonstrate it. Um, so what do we get between 1939 and 1941? We get a... A European war, which is not exactly a war, it's a semi-war, a phony war, uh, an American politician called it, phony war. Maybe it's a good phrase, not at all wrong. A uh, phony war uh, with sideshows. Let's see, World War I was a real war and had a lot of sideshows. So the British are active in the Middle East, uh, they're fighting all over Africa. Uh, Japanese active in the Far East, British and um, British encouraging the Japanese, Australians, and New Zealanders to seize territory from the German colonies, German island colonies in the Pacific. Uh, so the thing is going on all over the world, uh, World War I. These sideshows are kind of important. After the end of the war, uh, they give an indication of the colonial acquisitions made by uh, the British and the French and the Japanese as a result of this conflict and the law, colonial losses suffered by Germany. They lost everything in the Pacific, remember? They lost all their African colonies, divided between Britain and France. Um, so these sideshows, as Lloyd George put it in uh, kind of a pissy statement, uh, these sideshows are of great interest to the British Empire. Um, and so the sideshows are really going to be the centerpiece there's not going to be any big attack against Germany. There was no war. So people who say, oh, the British were in the war from 1939. Well, they had declared war, uh, but they were not waging war against Germany between 1939 and 1941. In fact, between 1939 and 1944, you have to say, um, not exactly waging war, except as they're dragged into it. So they're going to be involved in a number of conflicts in which the Germans are going to be involved. They're going to be drawn into a number of conflicts in which the Germans are going to be involved. They'll be fighting in North Africa. Let me see if I can get some kind of a map of North Africa. So the British will be fighting in, in North Africa, but they'll be fighting the Italians coming out from the Italian colony of Libya and fighting against Egypt. So the beginning campaigns against the Italians, they're going to go quite well for the British. And then the uh, Germans came to the aid of the hapless Italians, uh, losing out to the British in a big way. They came to the aid with Rommel and the Afrika Corps. And uh, we ended up with a um, very interesting kind of small conflict in North Africa, uh, in which the British came out on top. So, but Rommel wasn't supplied very much. This is just a side theater of the war. It's very important to the British psychologically, but not exactly a huge matter of defeating German power, you know, defeating Germany. No, it's just, you know, defeating Germany's aims to back up Italy over Egypt. That's essentially what, those were the stakes 
of the British flag. And then the British are also going to be active in, um, in Ethiopia, seized by the Italians in 1936. The British will maintain a big fight. They'll bring in all sorts of colonials into this thing. Um, most of the fighting that the British do in these theaters is not done with British uh, nationals. It's done with empire troops. They get people from New Zealand, from Australia, India, a lot of Indian troops, a lot of white South African troops um, uh, participating in this thing. They can't go through the uh, Mediterranean, uh, so they, uh, they come up uh, through the, uh, the um, uh, Indian Ocean routes to, uh, uh, to the Horn of Africa. And the uh, British were successful in this and uh, did rather well against the Italians. And uh, in fact, uh, might have, uh, they could claim that they, they won all of North Africa, uh, they drove the Germans out of, and the Italians, of course, they're mainly fighting the Italians, as you can see, um, drove them out until the Americans land in, um, in Morocco at the end of 1942. Well, I mean, what category would you put this sort of thing? I mean, uh, what are we fighting over exactly? I think we're fighting over the approaches to India. We're fighting over the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the short route to India. That's basically what we're talking about here. It's a, a, a traditional British imperial foreign policy interest. You have to ask the question, how much British imperialism figures in this balance of power now? as the United States has to calculate it. No, no American politician would dare walk into Congress and tell, tell American politicians uh, that he was fighting for the British Empire out of the question. Uh, but in the, in the, in the uh, actual doing of it, uh, the, the mounting of resistance, which uh, Roosevelt wanted to do, it does come into play, this idea of uh, essentially backing the British up, supporting them, encouraging them uh, to defend their empire. Uh, as long as it takes on, you know, Axis troops, takes them, takes them on in Italy, in the Mediterranean, uh, and in Germany to some degree with Rommel and the Afrika Corps. And then uh, you could say it also takes them on in um, the Horn of Africa, as we've indicated, and uh, even on the marches to India in Burma, when the Japanese are threatening Burma, the, even the British who want to play ball with the Japanese against the United States, even they have to fight to defend uh, India against Japanese advance. So this is a struggle for the struggle for the British Empire for the most part. In the course of this period, the United States does not make common cause. It's not a war against all fascists. The British did not declare war. The French did not declare war against Japan. Quite the reverse, they made a deal with Japan, the Craigia Rita uh, Treaty of 1939, which recognizes Japanese interests in China. Now, that's another point that the British, where the British differ sharply with the United States. The United States wants to defend China against the Japanese. The British feel they have to come to terms with China without offending the United States too much, but of course they are going to do offend the United States, they want to come to terms with Japan over China. The British have Hong Kong. They've got to hang on to the Hong Kong Crown Colony, which they did through this period uh, by this treaty with Japan. So, so the British are not exactly fighting all fascism. They might even argue it's not even really a world war yet, because the United States is not in it, the Soviets are not in it, the biggest powers are not in it. Um, you might say it's a European war. You might even say it's a kind of an imperialist war. I don't know. One could argue in ways like this. And uh, certainly a phony war on the Western Front. Nothing's going on there. No attack against the Nazis by the British. No attack against them by the French, who are cringing uh, behind the Maginot Line. Uh, not much going on um, in World War II. You might even make the argument that uh, the British and the French were more worried about the Soviets in World War II so far, as to say up to 1941, uh, than they even are against the Nazis. That would be saying it very strongly, and uh, there are some people who do say it this strongly. Um, and it comes up over Finland. So part of the deal between uh, the Nazis and the Soviets 
1939 involves Finland. Um, it says, in effect, that um, there, the non-Polish regions of eastern Poland are going to uh, be a sphere of influence for the Soviets. And more than that, it says, uh, really all of East Central Europe, the Balkans and all the rest of it, they're areas of disinterestedness. They use a French word, désintéressement disinterestedness on the part of the Nazis. A really interesting way of putting it for the Nazis to say that to, to the Soviets, uh, disinterested in East Central Europe. Um, and of course, the Germans know they can say this and uh, attack them later. So uh, a guarantee of that sort, an agreement of that sort, you know, it's Maybe worth the paper it's written on, but not a whole lot more. Not a whole lot more. And part of this is uh, that they say the Soviets um, ought to be able to um, have a sphere of influence on with regard to Finland. Say Finland ought it doesn't say you can seize Finland, but the idea that um, the Finns the Finns um, have to absolutely make the Soviets happy. Uh, in any kind of question that comes up, because the Soviets are going to be boss. At any rate, it says the Germans are not going to defend Finland against the Soviets. That's the main thing. I, got, I should have got to that point originally. That's the first point you can make about it. Okay, so that Finland is allotted to a Soviet sphere of influence. So the Soviets immediately looked at this whole question of uh, the approaches to Leningrad. So you see in the bottom part of your picture, uh, I don't know if I've got it all properly in the bottom part of your picture, but most of it. And um, you see the Mannerheim line. This is a Finnish line of defenses um, in Finnish territory, uh, uh, just a little ways from Leningrad. So what the Soviets are worried about, obviously, here is they don't want the Mannerheim line to be used to set up artillery. There already is a lot of artillery emplacements there, um, you know, so you could bomb Leningrad or maybe attack Leningrad across Lake Ladoga. So you see Lake Ladoga there. Um, just to the south, or I should say northeast of, Lenin, of Leningrad on this map. Um, so the Soviets say, let's push the border a little bit more, they suggest to the Finns. The Finns say, no! The Soviets say, we really want this border to go with, and more than that, we want control over Hanko. This little port, which is a garrison, however, and which defends the approaches to the, uh, the Gulf uh, that approaches Leningrad. So the little, very minor territorial, but of course they're highly strategic, but they're small territorial demands made by the Soviets. And the Soviets say, oh, we'll compensate. Uh, up north, where the territory is not so strategic, we'll give you uh, some territory. In fact, we'll give you more territory. The Soviets offered them more territory in the north than we, than we get in the south. It's just a question of defending the Soviet Union. Well, that's hard to deny that it's a question of defending the Soviet Union. Also hard to deny that the Soviets really have no intention to absorb Finland and conquer it or anything like that. They want to. They want this arrangement to be worked out, but the Finns were absolutely in concrete about it. You can see why. But they're absolutely in concrete about it. No game, no kind of deal with Soviet Russia. Finally, the Soviets lost patience and attacked them in the famous Winter War, 1939-40. They attacked all up and down the front that you see indicated on this map. Did not do well at all. Fighting in the middle of winter, in the middle of snow, not going to be so easy to have these huge gains, even against an inferior opponent, such as the Finns were thought to be. Actually, they did not turn out to be so inferior. They did rather well, uh, fighting defensively, basically. So they had some very well-devised defensive um, uh, defensive emplacements against tanks and against ski troops. Uh, Soviets ransacked the Soviet Union for ski instructors to train their ski troops, Rostrov tells us. Um, didn't do, still didn't do well. And this war dragged on through the last months of 1939 into the spring of 1940. It looked terrible uh, for the Soviets. A terrible looking thing. The optics, as people would say today, the optics were couldn't be worse. Um, picking on poor little Finland. In league with the Nazis. 
picking on poor little Finn. Looked terrible. So that's the position the Soviets got themselves into in this winter, in this winter war. And while they were talking about that sort of thing, actually the British and the French were contemplating some sort of attack on the Soviet Union in defense of Finland. So there was an idea that the British ought to land troops up on the Atlantic coast of Norway. Can I get my pointer up there? Hope you can see this pointer to land troops on the Atlantic coast to bring them down in this direction toward the Gulf of Bothnia through the iron ore fields by means of which the Swedes were sending iron ore to Nazi Germany and did through the whole war and to continue until they came up against the Soviets and then to give aid to the Finns this is a plan of Chamberlain's to give aid to the Finns uh, in their fight against the Soviets. And it's uh, complemented by French plans at the same time to send bombing raids from Syria into the Soviet Caucasus. See if they could stir up the Muslims uh, in that region against uh, Soviet Russia. What? Now, there are ways of interpreting this. Um, the most uncharitable way of interpreting it, and this is a very strong case that's been made by some historians, the uh, British and the French really would rather fight the Soviet Union than Nazi Germany. And uh, they're, they're willing to take the chance on uh, taking on, they've already declared war against Germany, they're willing to take the chance on declaring war against both Germany and Russia at the same time. Well, ouch. Um, that would do violence to any sort of realistic thought on the part of any Western politician, you would think. The British and French can't balance Germany, number one. What chance have they got of balancing Germany and Russia? That's really, that's... Uh, that's a proposition. And in fact, the idea has been kicked around <laughs> if they were really serious. Uh, Hans Morgenthau in his book, Politics Among Nations, the Bible of the Realists in the United States, it brings up this question and says, can you imagine anything more foolish than that to think that you should run the risk of taking on both Germany and Russia at the same time? Well, if, it, if that were all to it, all there was to it, you know, of course, that argument would have force. Um, looking a little more closely into it, some French memoir literature by some French military people involved in it give the suggestion that what they're really trying to do, both Britain and France, is to stir up a little trouble on the borders of the Soviet Union, and uh, maybe the Nazis will take it, try to take advantage of this, and that what might come out of it is that their war, so to speak, be, be, between Britain and France and Germany and the West might be complemented by a war uh, between Germany and Russia. In other words, they're trying to break up the German and Russian peace. So that makes more sense to me. That interpretation makes more sense. At any rate, it's a very baffling episode, this idea of coming to the aid of poor little Finland. Now, it goes without saying, everybody's denouncing Soviet Russia, including the United States, denouncing Soviet Russia over Finland. But Roosevelt didn't denounce them so much that he said that, gee, we want to fight the Russians just as much as we want to fight the No, no, no. Roosevelt is contemplating through this whole period that somehow there's going to be some kind of break between Germany and Russia. Probably can't be provoked by the West. It, probably, it has to happen naturally, I guess. And Churchill, too, thinking the same thing. So Roosevelt and Churchill, who are not Kin, kin politicians, they're not uh, the same types. They met once, they didn't even like each other. Um, but even so, the possibility that there might be any, some kind of a break between Germany and Russia, that's always uh, up, uppermost in their mind. And Churchill gave um, 
voice of this when he said to Russia is a famous phrase. I never, never remember how it goes, but famous phrase, uh, Russia is a riddle clothed in enigma, a mystery clothed in a, rig, uh, a riddle wrapped in an enigma. <laughs> you know, Russia cannot be understood. <laughs> but most people don't quote the next couple of sentences uh, where Churchill goes on to say, uh, but maybe there is one way of understanding Russia in terms of its national interest. In terms of its national interest, can Russia put up with the Germans dominating the Baltic and the Black Sea regions indefinitely. Ah, that's an interesting point. Maybe not. But they're very realist, realist, realistic thought uh, that Churchill and Roosevelt are having at about this time, that maybe there might end up being some kind of friction between the two. And of course they're thinking, in that case, we side with Russia. We side with Russia against Germany. Well, they're not buying the totalitarianism theory, are they? You argue from the standpoint of totalitarianism, you have to take on FDR and Churchill on this topic. So there we are. Um, so at any rate, uh, this all became academic, This uh, these attempts to take on Russia by Britain and France, it became academic in the spring of 1940 when the Finns gave in and the Russians uh, t made those little changes uh, to their border, strategic changes to be sure. And the Finns are going to be very unhappy with them. They're going to join with the Nazis uh, when the Nazis attack Russia. Uh, Finland will attack Leningrad, and Finland will start arguing in terms of a greater, a greater Finland, which is going to include this whole peninsula, include that whole area. And of course, um, right-wingers in the West very unhappy that the Nazis didn't do enough for the Finns against the Soviets. Hmm, that's a continuation of this theme on the right of, um, of Hitler betraying us uh, by not doing enough against the Soviets. And in this case, it's not helping the Finns enough against the Russian advance. Hmm, interesting point. And then here's another right wing. Uh, a cartoon about it from the French. And it says, Un chien qui, qui ne rapporte pas. Um, it's, a, it's a dog that doesn't, uh, doesn't call when it's, uh, I mean, doesn't, um, doesn't um, come when it's fetched. Uh, <laughs> doesn't come when it's called. <laughs> uh, so as I say, so Hitler has, is playing ball with and not with uh, Stalin, but look, Stalin is grabbing a little piece of Poland, a little piece of Finland, grabbing, grabbing. We're not even worrying here about what Hitler's grabbing. So this is definitely a you know, part of a French right wing, French right wing thought on this thing that the Hitler Stalin pact really benefits Stalin rather. But at any rate, they know darn well it doesn't benefit, benefit Stalin more. But the, uh, the Stalin factor is the one that concerns them. Stalin is more the enemy than Hitler. There is that thought. Those people are going to continue. They're going to transmogrify. They're going to be interested in, um, in, in the turning against the Soviets after the war. They're going to have a big influence on Churchill. Churchill is eventually going to go along with them. Uh, the uh, people representing this point of view in the British Parliament in the conservative party, the right wing, the conservative party. People who had been isolationists, interestingly enough. But the, um, the continuing theme is their anti-communism. They're anti, or maybe putting it, maybe even more accurately than anti-communism, they're anti-Russianism because of the traditions of British imperialism and its antagonism geopolitically uh, to, the, to the Soviets. Well, Hitler solved all those problems for everybody. Uh, by attacking in the West in, uh, in the spring of 1940. So he attacks Norway. Uh, he attacks the Low Countries, attacks France, conquers France, and even starts taking up the fight against England. So he settles the whole question. No more chance of any kind of war with France. Now, Stalin knew uh, that the French probably wouldn't attack Germany, but he didn't figure the Germans would overrun France. I mean, they didn't in World War I. 
if there's any kind of hope, and that must have been the way Stalin was thinking, if there's any kind of hope that Germany will get bogged down as they did in World War II, World War I, and, um, and have to fight the French in the trenches, that kind of thing. Uh, if there's any hope of that, that's dashed by the very quick victory of the Germans over the French by means of their blitzkrieg tanks and tactical aircraft working in tandem. We'll talk a little bit more about that next time. So fall of France, wow, that is the end. The Germans are going to control the entire continent. The British even seem impotent uh, to stop them in Norway. So they really, they really don't look like much. And so uh, Soviets have to make some recalculations. Not only are they going to think of East Central Europe in terms of a sphere of influence promised by Hitler, about which they're not going to do much, which they don't, but now they actually move actively into the Baltic states and uh, try to see about seizing them and forcing them back into the Soviet Union. Now, they only did this after the fall of France. I don't think they could possibly have thought in those terms until France fell. So that's the reaction to France. Then the other thing they did was seize a little piece of territory here. I wonder if I've got a decent map of this called Northern Bukovina. There it is. Seize a little piece of territory up in here around the town of Chernovitz, Chernovtsi, Chernauti. Uh, it, sh it has several names, a little town here. And this area is called Northern Bukovina. And uh, the Soviets said that they would round out the Ukraine by taking over this territory. So it's already allotted to them. They're probably going to take Bessarabia. This, this they did. But they go ahead and take northern Bukovina. So why did they do that exactly? It really annoyed the Nazis. Hitler said, the Russians are pushing me up against the wall. Huh? Pushing me up against the wall over northern Bukovina? What's the point there? Ah, but if you, if you take a look where it is on the map, the Ploiesti oil fields are just north of Bucharest here. There's a rail line that goes directly north-south between northern Bukovina and the capital, Bucharest, that goes right into the oil fields. Soviet seizure of these oil fields presents to Hitler the threat that the Soviets might send some troops to these oil Immediately, Germany reinforces its garrisons in Romania, and it's going to build up a lot of forces in Romania, uh, because that's the only oil supply that Hitler has got, and he sees uh, Stalin as threatening him over that. So that becomes a serious bone of contention after the fall of France. Well, then there's a big battle of Britain at the end of 1940, where the, um, the Germans are trying to prepare for an invasion, actually, of Britain, and they have to do it with uh, air attacks and uh, a great, great moment for the British Air Force. Um, they, they managed to fight off these German, German air attacks, luckily for everybody. I, if Britain had fallen at this point, it'd be tough going for the Americans. They lose this terrific staging ground to bring troops into the continent. So that what would have happened in effect is the Soviets would have won World War II without any help at all. So for the United States to even get into the thing, when it does, uh, it's going to need Britain. But luckily, the British held out. To their credit, uh, they are just to boast about their great victory over the Nazis in the Battle of Britain and everything that, that goes with that. Uh, but the um, failure to take Britain now presents the Germans with nasty problems. Uh, this thing with Britain's going to continue, which means they're going to get bombed. The British strategic bombers are capable of reaching German towns, and they're doing it while this thing is going on. So the Germans are going to have to put up with this colossal bombing. And not that it made a huge difference. Of course it made a difference. I can't say that. But um, they're going to have to put up with this thing. So what are they going to do? Uh, so maybe they can try to see if they can get the Soviets involved and in hurting the British in some way that makes them collapse. Maybe the Soviets should attack India. <laughs> in November 1940, Hitler huddled with Molotov and seriously suggested to Molotov, why don't you guys march on India? Well, you know, that's what the British were afraid the Russians were going to do through the whole 19th century. So that's a old, old story. Why don't you guys 
march on India. And so on. Molotov said, pardon me. Molotov said, well, you know, this is a splendid idea, of course, uh, you know, attacking the British Empire together with, uh, with you. Molotov was instructed not to disagree with anything Hitler said. Uh, the, you know, so that's all fine, Molotov said, but um, we're a little bit worried about all these troops you put into Finland. What, what, what's the point there? Are you guarding the Finnish nickel mines? We, uh, we uh, wonder about these nickel mines and think them valuable. Um, can't you ease up? I thought Finland was a, a, a sphere of influence for us. Why are you putting troops into Romania? Um, aren't these guaranteeing Romania against us? And all these other questions closer to home. And uh, Hitler and Molotov could not hit it off. Could not hit it. Hitler thought he'd treat Molotov the way he treated all the other Central European politicians and cow them and get them to do all sorts of bizarre things. And, but he was not dealing with that sort of thing when he was dealing with the Soviet Union. And besides, Molotov had no power to negotiate anything, just to state the Soviet positions. And the Soviet positions are really putting up a pretty much a brick wall against the Nazis. No accident that after this conference, Hitler said, we really got to move ahead with the plan to attack Russia. He'd already kicked this around <clears throat> in July 1940, but you know, plans can always be canceled. Now he said, oh, we really got to get through. We really got to go after these people, got to, got to attack Russia. Attack Russia, imagine that, attack Russia. Here's where the attack is actually going to come. But before it came, Hitler was presented with a number of options. Instead of attacking Russia, it was suggested to him, instead of attacking Russia, why don't you move to the south? Well, this has to do with a revolt in Greece, a revolt in Greece against Mussolini's troops, which invaded from Albania, and the Greeks drove them back into Albania. So the Greeks look kind of robust here, at which point the Soviets said they were going to back up Mussolini sent troops through Yugoslavia to attack Greece on behalf of Italy, as Germany had uh, been doing in South Africa, uh, North Africa as well. And the British trying to put troops into Greece, hopefully, to uh, attack these German forces. Didn't work, just like Dunkirk, just as the British troops were evacuated from Dunkirk when France fell, British troops had to be evacuated from Greece. Greece fell. So the Nazis poured over Greece and ended up coming as far as Crete, which they took with a huge paratroop attack. So now that the Nazis have come about as far, look at the distance between Berlin and Crete. That's about the same distance between Berlin and Moscow. And you could say it's even better tank country between Berlin and Moscow. The only problem is the Russians are there. Ah. That's the problem, all right. Russians are there. Uh, you can see Hitler's temptation. His Navy people are telling him, no, no, you've come as far as, as Crete. Let's not take on the Russians. Let's have a naval adventure in the Eastern Mediterranean. We'll stir up the Arabs. We'll seize the Middle East. We'll really give the British a hernia over this. Um, this is the way to go. And so Admiral Dönitz and Navy people are, Hitler's not a Navy man. Hitler's not a, how to put it, he's not even a world politician, in my opinion. He's a continental politician. He's thinking in terms of Bismarck in the 1860s. Thinking in terms of continental wars and the expansion of German power on the continent. Now, if you're thinking about that, you have to think about Russia. It's the only place you're going to get oil uh, that will last you indefinitely and every other kind of mineral you can think of, um, every kind of agricultural commodity from Ukraine, but of course wheat, <laughs> all those things. Germany is not self-sufficient in food, really, strictly speaking, even today, not strictly speaking. Um, so Russia's the ticket. And besides, he's got a big army, Hitler has, big army, and that's his thing. He's not going to let that army sit and wait for two or three years 
while they fool around in the Mediterranean and Stalin continues to build tank divisions. More than that, Hitler has a argument that really is his argument all the way. And it's the argument that the real enemy is in the Soviet Union. I mean, it almost doesn't matter what else we Nazis have accomplished if we can't defeat the Soviet Union. We cannot rule the world together with the Soviet Union. In fact, that's the only way they could have ruled the world. They had a real chance. I lament to say they had a real chance to rule the world together with the Soviet Union. We're very lucky. Hitler took the opposite view. The view that he had to destroy Bolshevism, Jewish Bolshevism. In the end, that was his ruling, ruling passion. And so it had to go that way. <clears throat> the Hitler Stalin Pact had to be just an episode preparatory to the full German attack on the Soviets. And of course, there is this lament that Molotov made. Remember, Molotov is the architect of the Hitler-Stalin Pact. He's been arguing for it since 1936 or so. Remember, they shot a lot of people who might have opposed it in the Soviet Union. But Molotov saying to a German ambassador uh, when he heard about the German attack on Russia, what can we have done to deserve this? And the real answer to that question I've always thought was that it's not what you've done, it's what you are. That's why the Nazis are coming. So let's talk about that next time and contribute to the forums and take part in this discussion where we're having about these world's shaking issues. And don't be cowed by this awful situation we're going through. Uh, keep your brains alive, contribute, write, think, fight, fight. And uh, I will see you next time when we discuss the great struggle between the Nazis and the Soviets on which the whole fate of the human race ultimately depends.